hopefully for it to settle in a little bit more deeply in our understanding about why why it's significant. It's not it's not an artificial thing uh, for for us. And so uh, so with that, let's ask God to help us and, and a couple questions for you, and, and we'll jump into it. Okay. Uh, dear God, we thank you that we can be together here this morning. We're uh, fewer in number, um, and we're, our church is a little bit more dispersed uh, this morning than it uh, normally is. But uh, we thank you that, that we can uh, get together, and even through technology, we can connect uh, with one another. Uh, we thank you for uh, Eli and Sadie for their faithfulness uh, in serving you, Lord, and where you have uh, placed them and called them, and that, um, that you have called us uh, here together to serve you and to proclaim uh, your your salvation and make known uh, your great deeds, Lord. And as we consider what it means uh, for what you have done in placing us in the church and how we, that is expressed in our lives and, and and how we relate to one another and to you, Lord, and just allow these things to settle into our hearts and understand it would confirm within us and, and create in us a desire to fulfill what you have called us uh, to be as members of the uh, of the church of the body of Christ, Lord, as of this uh, holy structure, this building that you're putting together for your purposes and your glory, Lord, and that we would embrace and, and live consistently and faithfully uh, to what you have called us and what you have made us, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to just uh, two true or false statements here. I think they're fairly evident to us, but there's a, a significance and a purpose in, in asking them. And as I've been studying a little bit more through the uh, this topic of marks of the church, like what is in a, like it keeps coming over and over again to me is like the interconnection with marriage and the church. How marriage, I even uh, encounter something like because marriage is prior to the church. It is very, very significant, very, very significant, and almost, it, 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 I don't know, almost like, what is the picture of which? Uh, is the church a picture of marriage? Is marriage is a picture of the church? There's a very close relationship that we have uh, here. And so with that, uh, true or false statement, the healthiest and happiest marriage are those in which partners keep their options open. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think it's probably evident uh, to us, despite uh, what our culture is is, uh, is saying to us that that uh, keeping your options open, there may be something better uh, along the way, is just not going to produce a, a very healthy relationship, nor nor a happy one. Uh, then another um, true or false: uh, once the commitment to marriage is made. The rest of the relationship takes care of itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, if any of you have found that to be the case, you know, tell us the uh, your, your, the secret. There, there's, there's, so there's two aspects uh, of this. Yes, uh, there's two aspects of it. That uh, on the first hand, you can't just simply care for someone and not for there not to be some measure of commitment uh, to them. That's what our culture is trying to live out. We're, we're trying to say, I, I really care for you. I value you, you're significant to me, but I, I can't really commit myself to you because internally I may change. My feelings may change. Uh, my circumstances may change. Something better may come along. Uh, so it, it just doesn't work, uh, nor is it nor is it realistic to say, I have made this commitment uh, to you, uh, and therefore I have done my part, and now you know I can go about you know the other things that are a part of my life. Uh, neither, neither one of them seem to work very well. And the reason that we start here with, with marriage again, because of Ephesians uh, chapter five, and it's not just in Ephesians, we I don't know how much I, uh, we talked about this before, but even in the Old Testament, there's this picture of Israel being an unfaithful spouse to the Lord. That image is brought up over and over again by the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, even Hosea. Think of Hosea's ministry. His whole ministry is God telling him to marry someone who would not be faithful to him as a picture of the relationship between uh, Israel and the church. So it's all through that. Now, so because of that, let's just, I just want to take a moment to consider uh, marriage. Uh, here is this, this picture to help us to understand the, the church and even the church, the, 
uh, portrays what what marriage is is to be. Um, so, if uh, two people live together, uh, does that produce marriage? Okay. Yeah, 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 it's false. We see that in our culture all the time. Uh, it is a maybe almost a substitute uh, type of, of marriage, but two people uh, living together does not, even as our culture may look at that as a partner or a, a partnership, it doesn't, it is not the essence of marriage. All right, so let's, let's look at another aspect of it. Uh, when two people fill out a marriage license and go before a justice of peace, uh, do they then become married? According to the statements, it's recording. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're, yeah, you're, you're at least going legally. Yeah. Yourself to the other person. Yeah. Yeah. That in the eyes of the state, that is, this is a, a legal uh, binding. There's a contractual legal recognition, a civic uh, uh, recognition of this uh, couple within the state. But we already, if you're thinking about what happened this past week, where our our legislature is passing um, a new legislation that uh, two men or two women uh, can be also recognized uh, as married couple. Is that is that truly marriage? Okay, in the eyes of the state, civically, yeah, there is a legal contract that the state's going to recognize. Uh, but but is that at its essence marriage? So here's another way to kind of examine this, another aspect. Uh, do two people who say vows to one another before witnesses in a church uh, become married? So now you're like, uh, it's like all these uh, fine tuning here. What, what are we getting at out here? Adding the marriage, marriage license with that, because that's at the end. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Usually, already have the marriage license. Yes, you've got the marriage license. It's maybe even already signed. Uh, uh, signed it before the uh, uh, service or something. Uh, so does does that ceremony uh, uh, then make two people married? Okay, like certainly as a religious ceremony, guys, as a church, uh, that like you can have a religious <laughs> ceremony for two people of the same sex. Again, we're trying to like we have a whole different category uh, of here. Um, and if those two people uh, go before a pastor, a priest, or a rabbi, uh, then are they thereby uh, married? Okay, in the eyes of that church, in the eyes of government, maybe before other people. Uh, what is it that is the, the heart of marriage? So let's uh, turn to um, Matthew 19. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. And see why we're, they were talking about this when we're talking about marks of the church. Uh, yeah. Whether he got off on some little tangent. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a controversy, a controversy going on in this passage here is the issue of divorce. And the Pharisees at the time had pretty lenient standards for divorce. Uh, if you were in a, uh, uh, for particularly for men, if you were in a, uh, uh, a marriage in which you were dissatisfied in some way, it was fairly easy to get out and just to marry somebody else. And so there's this uh, conflict uh, going on. This is not something that Jesus seems to uh, uh, view as, as good or as right according to the law. Uh, so in verse 3, some Pharisees come to Jesus testing him and asking him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Uh, and then Jesus answers. Uh, this is good. What does Jesus do? He just kind of pointing them back to what God has already said in, in Genesis. Uh, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So he's all, all the way back to Genesis 1. And he said, uh, then going to Genesis 2.24, and then Jesus said, again, he's just quoting scripture, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then, this is something that he's adding, he's clarifying. Um, they are no longer two, 
but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Where does Jesus identify uh, what creates and produces marriage? So what God establishes, what he brings together. Uh, that's what produces marriages. Now, now what, what do we do about all these other things that we see that are a part of, of marriage, <coughs> uh, living together? A, there's a, a civic or legal component to it. There's a religious uh, component uh, to it. So there is something that is happening in all those things. Are all those other things uh, superfluous, like irrelevant, uh, meaningless uh, to what marriage is? No, they are very significant parts of it. But at the very heart of marriage is what God does in bringing and putting uh, two people together. And there is a, there, there's something that is joined with the government and their recognition, uh, socially uh, recognized, and within the church, the body of Christ, that it would be recognized in that. Now, uh, does, uh, how does this help us to understand uh, church membership? Uh, so um, God doesn't just join two people together who have no interest or can't in any way uh, stand being around or have any willingness or desire to commit to one another, right? There's, so there's something that is personally involved, individually involved too. There's individual commitment uh, to one another. And yet in that committing of one to the other, God is joining them together. So I don't know exactly, like if you were to try to divide, well, what's uh, the individual's uh, part of it and what's God's part? Like, I don't know that I, I have or any of us have enough insight and understanding to see, well, uh, this is what you did. And this is what God did. We, we know that together, God joins two people together. And yet they are also themselves committing themselves to one another. And that it's done in the eyes of the state and before the, in, uh, the, the church. And, and that it's uh, something that even, so even when you see a pastor uh, say, I now pronounce you uh, man one, it is not, of course, the pastor that is joining them in marriage. The pastor uh, is just simply announcing what God has done here in the presence of that ceremony. He's recognizing, and yet there's also the participation of uh, those members, uh, the, the partners, uh, the husband and wife coming together. Now, uh, th this is a picture. This helps us to understand what's going on with the church as well. Uh, when when um, we trust Christ, he is he's, he's changing us. He's transforming us from death into life. He's placing us into the body of, the Christ, uh, body of Christ. The spirit is now placing us within the body of Christ. And yet there is also a necessary response on our part of faith and of trusting him. Trusting him. He's not going to place anybody into the church who's kicking and fighting and screaming like, no, I'm not going to go that. I believe in Jesus. All right. That's all I want. I want uh, Jesus. I don't want I don't want the commitment or to be tied down to the church. But there's there's not two separate things there. It's to be in the body of Christ, to be redeemed by Christ is is I, I, I want to say one and the same thing. There's a unity, even though there's different distinctions and things that God is doing in, in that. So if you were to see two people who committed themselves uh, in marriage and say um, that we are not going to, um, not going to, they're not going to live uh, together. Our finances are not going to be joined uh, together. Uh, our schedules are still going to be our own. Um, our priorities and our obligations are going to be unchanged because of this commitment. Would that thereby be a healthy uh, marriage? There, in any way that that would end up for the good of, of um, that relationship. For everybody to say, yes, I've committed to, the, to uh, you, but that, that we, our lives are still functionally going to be our own or my own, whatever my priorities and prerogatives are. It would not. Uh, would such uh, relationships and attitudes work within the body of Christ? Yes, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I want to keep my options open about other things that may uh, come along that may be better or 
for um, uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, there, 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 there are many uh, that we can. It, it doesn't work anymore. Well, it's it's not healthy for the body of Christ. It's not healthy for for a marriage. Um, so that's just a, a, an aspect of this, the, the health of, of, of membership and why it is a good, it's good for the church. It's good for, you, you just have all of these, these pictures of it. And let me give you one more. Turn to, um, let's just trace it through the, the scriptures. Turn to Psalm 118. We'll do a little bit of a, a biblical uh, Bible study uh, here. Psalm 118. Uh, to look at this other concept. Psalm 118 is a psalm of thanks. Um, referring to God's chosen ruler, king, and I don't know that this is necessarily written by David, but it's certainly speaking of his anointed uh, one, and the opposition to it. And we're not going to read the whole, whole psalm, but you can kind of skim through the nations. Verse 10 surrounded me, the name of the Lord, I, uh, I will surely cut them off, they surrounded me. Uh, there's this opposition to him. Um, it's a calling out to the Lord in his deliverance. I shall give thanks to you for you have answered me. Verse 21, look at verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, and then it goes on from there. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 21. Uh, Jesus refers uh, to this. Um, Matthew 21, 42. Jesus refers to this very passage, uh, same passage. Uh, he's also uh, dealing with um, uh, resistance to his authority and to who he is. There's kind of a resistance, a even a rejection of, of him. And uh, so Jesus says in verse 42, Matthew 21, he said, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I therefore say, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. Now, why is Jesus quoting this Psalm 118, 22? And what is he, what is he, what is the cornerstone referring to? Why is he, why is he referring to that? He's the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone. He's saying what Psalm 118 was saying about the God's anointed, his king, ruler. This is now being actually prophecy. This is being fulfilled in me because I am this, I am the cornerstone on which God is going to accomplish his purpose, build his kingdom, and yet he's being rejected. And then this is picked up by uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, he picks up this image. Uh, in this section, he's talking about the body being united, how Jews have been, or Gentiles have included into what God is, is doing, and uniting Jews and Gentiles into one body. And then in verse uh, 17, um, speaking of those, uh, the, the Gentile believers, he says, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Uh, for through him, we both have our access in one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building is being fitted together and growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So even uh, Paul is recognizing this whole church, this, this, you be, being built into a holy uh, structure, a holy temple uh, to the Lord, and you're being built on Jesus Christ. And then one other passage uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, same type of image uh, read, uh, that is being used. Um, Verse 4, chapter 2, coming to him as to a, a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, 
precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for those who believe, and for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling, and the block of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to those uh, and to this doom they were also appointed. You see, uh, scripture is pretty consistent all through here with the picture of Jesus being the chief cornerstone on which the church is uh, built, and we are being built on Jesus Christ together. Now, a, a holy temple, a, a royal peace priesthood, but the images of this building where God is being exalted and worshipped, and we're a part of it. Um, just as a mere illustration of this, uh, some of the most beautiful structures in the world that we see are where just stones are taken out of the ground, all right, from, you know, wherever uh, we were able to access, and they are put together to build a structure that people may travel all around, from around the world to view and to admire, to look upon take pictures of, have their picture taken in front, take their selfie in front of them, and all, all of this. Like just out of stones that were in the ground were of no value, of not much worth. And yet when they are placed together, they build up a structure that people come and admire and appreciate. That's the picture and the image that I think is coming through uh, these references to who Jesus is and what the church is supposed to be. Now, it occurred to me, there are places though where you can look at stones that are scattered around and are not built together into a structure. And we normally generally recognize those places as cemeteries. And I think in a way that pictures what we do with the trajectory on our own lives. Well, I will go my own way, do my own thing, and I will be a monument to myself. And you can take a slab of stone and you can put it over our graves, and that's that will be the monument in, in, in uh, to ourselves in our own lives and what we have accomplished and what our families did and what we're connected to. Or there is that taking us as living stones and joining in with other living stones built upon Christ to display the glory of God as a people who worship him and proclaim his, his uh, salvation, his majesty, his, his greatness. That's what membership is. Uh, it's not just merely a formal pit, pit, uh, filling out papers and and uh, uh, going through a um, uh, process to have some type of uh, ecclesiastical recognition. There's a part of that, but that's just a part where we're recognizing and affirming, this is who I am, and I am a part of the body of Christ, and I'm committing myself, I'm covenanting myself to that. Uh, let me just mention uh, four things very quickly to, to end. What does membership practically involve? And I, don't, we don't have time to look at the verses, but at least let me put them in our minds. Um, first, it's commitment to gather for worship, including communion. That's a part of membership. We often think that uh, church attendance, you know, that, you know, it's not, it's a good thing to do if you don't. It's, you know, not the best, but, you know, life is busy and that type of a thing. It is a very, very serious thing to, to, neglect, and even more so to not have a desire to gather to worship with other believers. It is not a small thing when we are of a heart and an attitude and mentality that that's not, that's not important to me. Uh, it, it doesn't reflect what God has done in those whom he has redeemed and put in part of the body of Christ. Uh, so their commitment to gather for worship, including communion, a commitment to attend a members meeting, that we are to abound in the work of the Lord. This is our, where we commit. We invest our lives. Uh, commitment to pray for the church. We're called to pray for one another, to invest our time praying and interceding and lifting up one another is a part of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. It is easy for us to just go our own way and think about our own things. I got enough things to pray about or worry about in my own life and my family's life. But part of church, it, it extends that to the body of Christ. And uh, fourthly, commitment to the give to the church. All that uh, God has given to me is his. It belongs to him. And I give, I uh, return what he has given to. I give to the church. I support the church because that's uh, what I'm, I'm a member. It's, it's, it's giving to what uh, God is uh, doing in, uh, 
in my life and has made me a part of. So just there's other things that we could kind of draw out on that, but don't have the, the time to do that. But at least give us a little bit of a picture. Let's finish with prayer. Here. Dear God, we thank you for the few uh, moments to look at and consider uh, some of your word and how you have portrayed and pictured this uh, the, the, this the body of Christ, Lord, uh, that we would be a part of it, we would fulfill uh, your purposes and your plans, that our lives would display the glory of Christ um, as we serve uh, you uh, together, Lord, as a part of the church. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.